Welcome back to the Fully Live Athlete Pastor channel. It is day number 56 in the online Bible reading club. Today we are going to be reading Numbers 9, 10, and 11. And we're also going to be reading Mark chapter 5, 1 through 20. Let's get into it. Now today you might wonder what's the theme. Well the theme is going to be the powerful presence of God. The powerful presence of God. If you look at number nine, uh, this is a, this is a one year after the events of Exodus 14 and 15, where the people are taken out of slavery, rescued from slavery against the most powerful man in the world and the, and the most oppressive regime, the Egyptian uh, nation, and they've only known slavery. They were enslaved for 400 years as a people, and none of them knew how to get out of slavery. None of them knew how to do it. And here comes Moses, and God used him, uh, ultimately used a bunch of miracles to get them out of the Red Sea and then crushed the Pharaoh's army with the Red Sea. And now you've got a free people. And in Numbers, when we get to Numbers, the fourth book of the Old Testament, Numbers is a terrible name for the book. You know, it's the, it's, it's a, it's an awful, unfortunate name. Uh, you know, it's, and it's better, better understood to be uh, journeying through the wilderness. That's what the, that's what's about. And so far we've seen that the people have been given marching orders of how to do it, how to camp, and now we're seeing as they're going to set out from Mount Sinai and go to the very edge of the promised land, they'll get there uh, in, in the end of Numbers and in Deuteronomy, and then we're going to be ready for the next stage, which is the conquest stage, when you get to Joshua. As you're thinking about the journey here, uh, the presence of God is with them. And so this is their first month of the second year after they come out of Egypt. That's the first verse there. It says it's, it's given us the, the, the timeline. And that means it's time to celebrate the Passover. The Passover is represented in what we just described, that the Lord rescued his people, brought them out of Egypt and into freedom. And they're going to observe this forevermore. This is their lasting ordinance. It's one of the most important days of the year they're going to celebrate the Passover. Well, what if someone's unclean? There's a makeup day for that. If you have uh, contact with a dead body, then you're going to need to be purified. And then the next month, same same procedure, there'll be a makeup day, right? So it says if you decide to just opt out though entirely and not avail yourself of this, if you're not for no, you have no excuse, then you should be cut off from the people. But it also says there at the end of verse 14, that these regulations will be for not just Jews, but anyone residing with the people. Meaning it's not about family lineage, it's about faith. Uh, it's, about, it's about God's work, actually. God sets people free, not according to their skin color, culture, whatever it is. God sets people free, and we need to know that. These signs, this Passover, is not communicating grace to them and transforming them. It's holding out the promises of God's grace to all who believe, uh, that these promises are for you. Uh, as, he, as he's redeemed in the past, he can be your redeemer and go before the fight for the people. And that's what Moses uh, exclaims as they move into the next chapter. Uh, and he, and he talks, it talks about how the, there's a cloud, a glory cloud over the temp tabernacle. And when the cloud would rest over the, the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, they would set up camp. And then when the cloud moves or the fire moves, uh, then it would, uh, then they would move. They, and it says there they, they obeyed the Lord's order. That's what the whole ver the last of chapter nine is uh, in Numbers. It's it's about how the cloud moves, they move. The cloud rests, they rest. And this is the presence of God. When the presence of God's there, there's power. They want to be where the presence of God is. And so they obeyed. And that's what, how you think about in the New Testament. It talks about how. We don't walk by sight, but we walk by faith. And notice that they are walking by sight, but it is faith. It's, it's resting in that, that God is trustworthy. And so when, we, when you think about faith, faith is not some irrational blind leap. Faith is based upon evidence, actually. It's based on, I, I know and can trust God. He's reliable, etc. So, so their faithful walking was commended uh, of them in, in chapter 9. When you get to 10, it talks about how they use trumpets to, to summon the people, uh, that they're going to uh, sound the blast and remember this Lord uh, when they go to, when they go to, to either assemble before camp, uh, camping or, or leaving, they use the trumpets. 
Uh, they'd also use the trumpets uh, for battle. Uh, they, they'd sound the trumpets to remember the day that God re- re- brought them out of um, and rescued from their uh, enemies. So they're to remember who God is. Now, they're going to leave Sinai. They go, and it's got the whole list of the peoples as they go through there. Not as exciting. Uh, then you've got Moses' speech. When he would give these same speeches. And this is something that's so helpful for all of us, is confessing our faith. And we do that in our services every week in our church. We confess our faith. We have these these pithy, well-crafted reminders of what the Scriptures teach about our Lord. And in the Moses says here, whenever the ark set out, he would say, Rise up, Lord. May your enemies be scattered. May your foes flee before you. And then when, when uh, the... When the um, Ark comes to rest, the cloud of fire over them, which represents the presence, comes to rest. It says, return, Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. So the presence of God is powerful, and Moses is recognizing that. Now you get into the final chapter of our Old Testament reading today, and you've got an overwhelmed Moses. Overwhelmed. He's got too much to do. The people are grumbling. They are unhappy. They had so much free food back in Egypt where they were slaves. They think, wow, it would be better to go back. And, and I look at, at verse 14 and 15, I think of an overwhelmed mom of little baby kids. Like We had three, three kids under three at one time. And you think about how just overwhelming it is to have the whining and the complaining and things like that. And it doesn't get any better, honestly, when you have teenagers sometimes because they can be just as, as uh, grumpy. And I'm sure they, they, the, the teenagers don't appreciate the adults' grumpiness too and grumbling and murmuring, right? So it's difficult. It's difficult to lead people. It's difficult to lead anybody in a church or organization or whatever. Well, so what God does is he says, bring me 70 elders. And you see here that the 70 are going to carry the burden off of Moses. They're going to share in the burden. And what he does there, God does, is he, he places the spirit upon them. And you think about, I think of two, two instances in the New Testament that really show this. Also, Jesus in Luke 10 sends out 70 of his, of his disciples to do preaching and healing and, and you know, to, to share in that burden, that work, right? It's not that he needed extra help, but he allows them to participate in it and he does it as he does in, in his baptism to fulfill all righteousness. Remember, he's living the ideal life for us. He's keeping every fulfillment of the commandments of God, uh, of the law, so that we can be saved. And so whereas Moses and the elders fail and their tasks, we in Christ succeed through His work. He sends out the 70. And you see the Spirit rests upon them. Think of the Spirit resting upon the people when the gospel was preached to them in Acts 70. The Spirit is a testimony to the presence, the powerful presence of God. And, 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 when, he, and when you see the power of God, the Spirit of God, you will, as Acts 1 8 says, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You'll testify, you'll bear witness, you'll martyrio to me. All right, well, so the people wanted meat. That was the deal. Well, so God says, I'm going to give them meat. I'm going to give them so much meat, they're going to be sick of it. They're going to have meat coming out of their teeth. All right, so he's going to curse them. And it says that he brings in a wind from the sea and it scatters quail, these birds. Uh, up to three feet deep. If you look at there, the two cubits, uh, that's a lot of it's a lot of birds. Uh, they, they're just brought to them, like the manna. They, they got tired of the manna, so they're like, we need meat. Well, he gives them meat. And they spread around the camp, and it says they started to eat. And then verse 33, when the meat was still between their teeth, before they could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people. And the bunch of them died. And that's horrible. That's a major fail on their part to grumble. So the powerful presence of God, if you're in the powerful presence of God, you better be grateful. You better be humble because you don't know who you're messing with. This is the creator. This is the sustainer of all things. He's governing all things and he dwells with you. That's why I say in Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. The fear of the Lord, right? So think about that. The The one who made all things powerfully dwells with you. And, of course, he's able to do anything he wants to do, right? Well, think about this. You talk about being unclean back in, as you move to the New Testament, think about being unclean back in uh, Numbers 9. Well, look at, look at 5. Look at 5 of, of Mark chapter 5 there. Look at this. 
Jesus is going to go into the Gerasenes, right? It's this uh, podunk land uh, very far east of the uh, Jordan River in, uh, in the Middle East here. And he's out there, and there's a, this place called uh, in the Gerasenes called the Tombs. And a man would live out there, and he was an absolute wild man. He was a, uh, actually possessed by a legion of demons. And, and you maybe heard this story, but it says that they, he was able to tear the chains off of him that they would bind him with because he was crazy. He was a possessed. He had this supernatural strength. And he dwelled amongst the dead. And, and so Jesus goes out to him. Unclean. Remember, people just didn't go and touch dead bodies. They didn't want to be out in the tombs area. And Jesus goes out to him. Now, he goes out. Uh, and, or he, go, he goes there, and this man comes to him, actually. The, the, the person's there. And, and it says there, uh, that's a detail in verse 2, but then when Jesus saw him from distance, he, the, the man ran and fell on his knees, and he shouted at the top of his voice, uh, Why do you come? What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? In God's name, don't torture me. So he's kind of like, it appears that he's maybe even uh, trying to do a spell, right? He's trying to do a spell against Jesus to... To, to bind Jesus from hurting him. But what Jesus is going to do here is fascinating. In Mark 3, 27, it says that when, when the Pharisees actually uh, accused Jesus of being of the devil and casting out demons by the devil, he says, listen, I'm coming into the devil's house, this earth, full of sin, and I'm going to bind the devil. That's how you take. That's how you rob a strong man, is you bind him and then take his stuff. So he's taking sinners... And bring them into the kingdom. What? Rewind a couple days and look that up, because it's fascinating that we're all the devil's bounty, and then Jesus comes and rescues us and brings us to the church to be gifts to others. And so what he's going to do is he's going to bind the strong man. Look at what it says here. It says Jesus says, "Come out of this man, you impure spirit." And he asks him, "What's your name?" So he says, "Legion," and he says, "We're many." Now, legion was like a, a Roman legion of 6,000 men or so. Uh, so he's got this big, big um, fleet of uh, or, uh, army of demons in him. And Jesus, they, they ask Jesus, hey, cast us out into those pigs. He sends them into the pigs. And what do they do? They run the pigs down into, into a, in, in a body of water and they die. Steep, and they go down into a lake. And, and so think, think about that. This is exactly what demons do. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Think about that. This is, this is a reductio ad absurdum. We think we can find life apart from God. But here, these demons are exposed. All they want to do is destroy. That's all they do. They go into the pigs and immediately run them down the hill. That's what they're doing to this man. Now, this man, who is known as this hellion, this, uh, this Neanderthal out there, breaking chains and a danger. Well, all the, all the guys who tended the pigs, the pig shepherds, go and tell the people in the town what happened. And they come out to him and they ask Jesus to leave. Why? Because they saw the man dressed and in his right mind and they were afraid. They thought, here's this magician, here's this man who's able to to turn this man from being a demon-possessed man into a calm man, and they were afraid, and they pled with Jesus to leave the region. They, the pow- they saw the power here. They didn't know it was Jesus, and there's no grace to tell them. Jesus didn't tell them who he was. Well, look, Jesus, who, who was about to get in his boat and go back, the man who was rescued of the demons in his right mind wants to go with Jesus. Jesus says, no, 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 you go back to your town, and you tell them, about the Lord, how He's given you mercy, and what He's done for you, and He will, and, and that's why I believe there were going to be Gentiles ready to hear the gospel once He got out there. Once the gospel got out there through the apostles after Jesus was raised, they were already prepared for this, and that's why we have a church today. Honestly, all right, it's beautiful. All right, that's a long one today, guys. But there's a lot to talk about in these verses, uh, Luke 9 through 11 and Mark chapter 5, the first part of it. Like it. Comment, subscribe, all that stuff. We love you guys. Love doing this. Love it. Absolutely love it. I hope you're enjoying it. We'll see you guys soon. Hopefully get a live stream going. I'll let you know. And we'll do some Q&A. Maybe we'll get through numbers. Okay. Peace. See you all tomorrow.